Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for your interest in EU CISVEX and in the outcomes of task 2.5 of the project. This is webinar number two in this series of webinars. The first took place on the 14th of May and focused on task 2.4 of the project. There will be two more subsequent webinars in June, which will focus on the work that took place in work package three. You will see that there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Throughout the presentation today, please feel free to ask your questions using this tool. We will hold a short Q&A session after the presentation and time permitting, we will endeavour to answer all your questions. Any question we do not get a chance to address, we will answer via email to all participants. For those of you who attended the webinar on task 2.4 a few days ago, you will be familiar with the aims and objectives of the EU CISLEX project. For those who are attending an EU CISFLEX webinar or presentation for the first time, I will provide a brief introduction to the context of the project and to the overall structure of the project itself. I will also speak about Work Package 2 in general and then more specifically about Task 2.5. I will introduce you to today's speakers before handing you over to them to discuss the key findings from the work. Today, the focus of the discussion will be on the financial implications of high levels of renewables for the continental European power system, the Nordic power system, and the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system. We'll then present some conclusions before beginning the Q&A session. Please note that the report for Task 2.5 is now published and available on the document section of the EU CISFLEX website, and I would invite you all to read the report after today's presentation. As we are aware, the European power system is on a path to decarbonisation by 2050. A crucial step on this path is the adoption of greater levels of renewable technologies. At present, about 30% of European electricity demand is met by renewable generation. This is expected to rise to 50% by 2030 and will need to reach even higher levels by 2050. It is important to remember that while there are various different types of renewable technologies that can support the goal of reaching 50% RESI, it is projected by the IEA and others that the majority of the growth in renewables over the next 10 to 20 years will be in variable and non-synchronous renewable energy sources, such as wind and solar PV. Hydropower potentials are largely exploited in many regions and biomass growth is limited by supply constraints. Consequently, the future power system will become increasingly reliant on non-synchronous sources of electricity, which will bring significant technical challenges. Today, we will illustrate that this also brings financial challenges for the generation portfolio. In addition to developments in renewable generation, there is also a trend towards sector coupling with, for example, increased electrification of heat and transport. While this is clearly an advantage and an opportunity, this can also create numerous challenges for system operation. Increased prevalence of communication and control technologies presents further challenges as well as opportunities. The EU CISFLEX aims to develop a roadmap for 2030 for the pan-European power system, where renewable energy is incorporated into the system in a robust and reliable manner. The project aims to identify and demonstrate large-scale solutions which can include technical options, procurement of system services, both new and existing, new operational strategies, and new market designs. The EU CISFLEX project is divided into 12 interrelated work packages. Four of the work packages, six, seven, eight, and nine, are dedicated to demonstrations. Work package two is the starting point of the project because its goal is to evaluate the challenges both technical and financial, arising in the future European power system. Work Package 2 seeks to answer a number of key questions. The first question in relation to the identification of technical scarcities is comprehensively addressed in Task 2.4. Task 2.5 focuses on addressing the impacts on system operation and on the financial environment for generators as a result of transitioning to power systems with high levels of renewables. In addition, Task 2.5 seeks to answer the question of what is the value of future system services. The 
The remaining two questions will be tackled in the sixth and final task in Work Package 2. The analysis in task 2.5 builds upon the work carried out in earlier tasks in Work Package 2. For example, task 2.2 of the project developed a number of scenarios. Two categories of scenarios were defined, core scenarios and network sensitivities. Core scenarios are central scenarios which define the install generation capacities by fuel type, demand, interconnection capacity and storage portfolios. These core scenarios are used throughout the project for technical and production cost simulations on a pan-European basis. The network sensitivities are variations on the two core scenarios. In particular, the purpose of these variations is to further stress the Ireland and Northern Ireland subsystems the Nordic power system and also the European sub-network. In line with the aims of the project, each scenario or sensitivity represents a power system with at least 50% resi. Each of the presenters will provide some more information on the scenarios and sensitivities that were utilised in their respective study systems. Deliverable 2.3 of the project outlined the models that were developed for use in Work Package 2. In order to identify technical scarcities, detailed models capable of simulating future power system operation needed to be developed. The models that were developed by each partner were strongly dictated by the technical scarcities that would be assessed in task 2.4. For example, the continental power system, which was studied by EDF, where they proposed to investigate issues around frequency stability. Consequently, EDF developed unit commitment and frequency stability models. Airgrid and Sony sought to identify a wider range of technical scarcities on the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system, and this dictated the need to develop a broader range of models and supporting tools. Similar models and tools were developed for the other study systems as required. The models that were developed in task 2.3, which are pertinent to today's presentation, are those that perform production cost simulations, and include Plexus, which was used by Airgrid and Sony, Continental, which was developed by EDF, and Wilmar, which was developed by VTT. As I previously mentioned, Task 2.4 identified that there are significant technical challenges expected in 2030. A wide range of technical scarcities, illustrated in this table in red, were identified for the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system, while two technical scarcities were seen for the Continental system. In addition, for the continental European power system, significant areas of concern, shown here in yellow, have been identified and include falling inertia levels and increased levels of congestion. In general, an evolution of system needs, shown here in green, has clearly been identified for all systems examined. The key conclusion from task 2.4 is that if mitigations are not put in place in 2030, the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system will be experiencing significant technical issues associated with high levels of renewable generation, while the continental system and the Nordic power system generally appear to be evolving towards such technical scarcities. For a more detailed discussion on the work in task 2.4, we would like to direct you to the webinar recording which is now available on our website. In addition, for further information on any of the tasks in Work Package 2, please see the reports which are now completed and published on our website. And the link is shown at the bottom of this slide. So task 2.5. The objectives of task 2.5 are to assess the impact of transitioning to power systems with high levels of renewables, to determine the impact of high levels of renewables on energy revenue, and to identify if there are financial gaps for certain technologies in 2030. And finally, to estimate the value of system services in a power system with high levels of non-synchronous variable renewable generation. There were five partners involved in task 2.5, EDF, VTT, Airgrid, Energy and PSE. EDF, VTT and Airgrid conducted the production cost simulation studies, which are the focus of today's presentation. Energy and PSE provided their insight and expertise in relation to issues around congestion and curtailment in Germany, and the investment costs associated with reactive power mitigation in Poland, respectively. Today, we will focus on the main objectives of the task, and I will now like to introduce each of the speakers in turn.
Caroline has more than 10 years experience in the energy and numerical simulation sectors. Caroline has been in EDF since 2008 and has conducted important strategic analysis on the French power sector. She is strongly involved in the assessment of renewable energy integration. Today, Caroline will present on the findings from the analysis on the continental European power system. UC is a senior scientist in the field of energy systems at VTT. He has more than 15 years experience in energy systems research and his research focuses on sector coupling, demand response, district heating, electric vehicles, heat pumps and system stability. UC will present today on the findings from the studies of the Nordic power system. Carol works as part of the innovation team within Airgrid. Her work focuses on the integration of new technologies and system services, which help to deliver a low carbon energy future while also ensuring a safe, secure and efficient power system. And Carol will present on the results from Ireland and Northern Ireland. So I'd now like to hand you over to Caroline. Thank you, Sheila. So uh, the next slide. Thank you. So, uh, the objective of the study on the continental power system is to understand how large shares of variable renewables are going to be changing the power system and what their impact is on the economics. So as Sheila mentioned, we have two core scenarios as part of the AUC Flex uh, project. And here, what we want to see is that uh, what the impact of variable renewables. So since the scenarios that are the base scenarios have a lot of differences, for example, we have different um, generation mix, we have different economics, we also have different uh, prices of CO2. Uh, we have developed some sensitivities where we took um, as a basis renewable ambition. So we took the uh, generation mix of uh, renewable ambition uh, with hydro, biomass, CCS, nuclear, and then we increased the share or decreased the share of uh, renewable, uh, variable renewable energy, so wind and solar. Uh, to reach shares that are 23% as in energy transition, 34% as in renewable ambition, 45% and 55%. And then uh, what we did was that we adjusted uh, the CCGT, so combined cycle gas turbine, and the OCGTs, open cycle gas turbine, so that we have uh, three hours of loss of load for all of our different sensitivities. This is so that we can compare the different um, sensitivities, variants, and that we have the same level of service in each of our uh, four sensitivities. So now I'm going to move over to the next slide. We have um, to do this study, we are um, using a, a European wide unit commitment model. I, I have a prompt to uh, change to the next slide. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, this unit commitment model has a very detailed set of uh, data. So we first describing about 20 countries. We are describing uh, per country, the production unit. So we're going to have um, the renewable energies. We're going to have conventional plants. We're also going to have uh, batteries, for example, in task 2.6. Uh, for uh, all our conventional plants, we have a uh, availability that depends on the, on the season. So we have uh, more availability over the winter. And we also have in our description uh, also some flexibility such as pumped hydro storage. Each of the country are uh, linked by interconnections. So this is representing our power system. Then we're going to uh, describe the uh, macroeconomic context. So in there, we're going to describe the fuel prices and the CO2 prices. This context is going to be the same for each of the four variants that we're going to be presenting today. Then, What's very important is to model the difference in uh, weather patterns because what we have is that we have a system where we have very large shares of variable renewable energies. Um, and so atmospheric conditions are going to be very important. So we are relying on 55 different climate years. So what those are is that those are years with a uh, past, um, so it's past years on which we have uh, taken the new location of different uh, renewables. We have also the different technologies such as they are projected uh, for the years we are looking at. And we have recomputed, so from the uh, wind speeds, the solar radiation, or the hydro, and as well as the temperatures, we have uh, recomputed the variable um, generation, uh, gener variable uh, renewable regeneration, and also 
so this is for the production side. And as far as the demand side, we know that demand is also linked to the atmospheric uh, condition. And so um, the uh, demand is computed for each of those uh, 65 parameters. Uh, our demand is going to be including some flexibility solutions such as electric vehicles and uh, water heaters. So those are pre-optimized in the shape of the demand uh, in our data set. So uh, our first step is to do the investment loop, which is allowing us to uh, add in CCGTs and OCGTs as needed so that we have at most three hours of uh, loss of load for the power system. And then we're using the continental mall. The continental mall is giving us for each of the plants, for each of the year, um, an hourly planning for, um, for, the, uh, for the production. And uh, so we have a lot of data. And uh, in the following slides, you will see that we are going to be speaking either uh, on average, or we're going sometimes to look at a specific country, or sometimes we're going to be looking at a specific weather year. So I'm going to move on to uh, the next slide. And uh, here, what we are trying to um, see is we are trying to understand how the system is changing. So on the left, we have the plants that are not moving, that we have not changed. So they're the same for all variants. So we have hydro, biomass, CCS, CHP, and nuclear. On the right, we have the wind and the PV. So the wind in green and the PV in yellow, which is going to be the same color code for the rest of the presentation. And in the middle, we have the CCGTs in red and the OCGTs in black. And we see that uh, as we are going from the bottom, so from 23% variable renewables to 55% variable renewables, um, that the uh, makeup of CCGs and OCGs are changing. But globally, we see little impact on the need for conventional plants as we are uh, increasing the share of variable renewables. What we do see is that uh, there is an increasing need for peaking plants. So the part that is black is getting larger as we are going up inside the graph. So now we're going to see on the next slide what the impact is on the conventional plants. So on the conventional plants, uh, we're looking at the load factors. So the red is the CCGTs and at 23% variable renewable energies, we have uh, almost 60% load factor. However, when we go to 55% variable renewable energies, uh, the load factor is dropping to less than 20%. If we look at the load factor of OCGTs, we see that the load factor is increasing uh, slowly uh, between the different variables. So now we're going to look in the next slide, uh, what happens to variable renewable energies. And so uh, what we are looking at here is the curtailment that is done for supply and balance um, equilibrium. Uh, so when we have 23% variable renewable energies in the power system, we see that we have uh, almost no curtailment. And we see that as we're adding uh, renewables inside our power system, we have uh, production that gets curtailed more and more up, up until we reach about a pose of 20% of 10% sorry, for the 55% uh, uh, case. So this, is, uh, this shows that we're having a lot more time where the rest generation is going to be exceeding the, the demand. And so uh, we already have, as I said uh, in some of the previous slides, some flexibility and we have already some EVs, but um, we actually still have time where we are um, having too much uh, rest production. And I just want to add here that this curtailment is um, only for supply and demand uh, balance. Um, there was a, a work that was done by uh, Energy on the curtailment that just comes from congestion that they're experiencing with high uh, renewables in Germany that is, not, um, that, that is not taken into account in this study. Um, we are only looking at the supply and demand balance, but this is a big problem for, uh, as mentioned by Energy. All right, so, um, then I'm going to uh, show you a, um, what happens on, on an example. So here what we have is a, an example on a specific country. So it's, uh, it's Germany. In Germany, uh, we have like a dashboard on this slide where we have on top the generation, then the marginal cost, and then the import exports. So we are looking on a specific climate year. 
And here we have uh, a situation uh, over the uh, two week period in the spring, where we see that we have a succession of period where we have low res generation and high res generation. And so um, if we look at the first turquoise rectangle, uh, we have low res generation. And so we see that uh, the green part, which represents wind, is rather low. So uh, we have fossil fuel that is producing in orange. And then we have a large um, share of uh, blue. The blue represents the net import. And uh, the, when we look at the bottom graph, what we see is that, so this blue represents almost 40 gigawatts. So 40 gigawatts um, is representing about half of the demand in, uh, in Germany. At the same time, because it's a bit tense, we see that we have a high uh, marginal cost. So then we're going to move on a couple of days later to a situation where we have a large rest generation. So here we see that we have a lot of, of uh, green, so that's the wind, and a lot of yellow, which is the solar. Um, we see that the fossil fuels are disappearing. And uh, if we look at the bottom graph, what we see is that uh, we have a lot of exports. So Germany is exporting a lot towards its neighbors to, uh, with almost uh, 40 gigawatts. And um, the exports are at the solar time, so when solar is producing a lot. However, uh, when we see at the top graph, we see that there's a dashed yellow, and the dashed yellow corresponds to some curtailment because there is uh, too much production uh, compared to the demand and the exports that can be done uh, for Germany. If we look at the middle graph, uh, we look at the, so the marginal cost, and we see that the marginal, co marginal costs are fairly low, and that uh, at the solar hours, uh, they are actually dropping to zero. So this is a, a case of a springtime. Now we're going to look on the winter time uh, in the next slide. And uh, in the winter, what we, uh, so here I just want to remind you that uh, we have adapted uh, the mix so that we have at most three hours of loss of load on average. So here I chose a specific year in which there is loss of load. So that's not all the years, but this is a specific case. And so I want to show you what's happening um, in one of those loss of load situations. So here we have uh, on the top a situation where, again, we have uh, not very much wind, so the, the green is very uh, small. And um, here again, uh, we have a lot of fossil fuel. We have also some, um, in dark blue, the um, import. If we look at the bottom graph, the imports are about 20 gigawatts, so we see that the neighbors cannot supply as much power as they could in the previous um, example. And so as a consequence, we see on the top graph that there are some times where, which are shown in purple, where we have loss of load where we don't have enough um, generation to meet the demand. And as a consequence, in the middle graph, the marginal costs are going to the roof. So now that we, we saw how the system was working. Uh, we're going to look at the economics of the system uh, in the next slide. And so uh, here we took a specific uh, country, but this is the same for the different countries that we studied. So we see that we're representing in orange the marginal cost. So the marginal cost starts around 100 euros per megawatt hour. It drops to about 50 euros per megawatt hour. So we have, it's cut about by half. So this is explained by, uh, in part, by the curve that's in uh, blue, where, uh, which represents the uh, hours, the share of hours in the year where the marginal cost is zero. And we see that at 23%, it's, uh, we have almost no time where we have zero marginal cost, whereas at 55%, we have almost 10% of the hours where we have uh, zero marginal cost. So this is the marginal cost, and we're going to look at the total cost of the system, and in particular, look at the split between fixed cost in orange and uh, variable cost in blue. So uh, we have fixed cost in orange that represent 60% of um, the total cost structure at 23% uh, VRES. And when we go to 55% VRES, we have 90% of the share of the cost, which are fixed costs. And this uh, calculation does not take into account 
the additional network costs, which we know are going to be significant, but which we did not add into this um, calculation. And so this uh, asks the question as to which uh, market design uh, needs to um, be for power system with large renewable shares of uh, variable renewable energies uh, to promote uh, the right investments and to have a resilient system. So in the next slide, uh, we're going to look at the, uh, what happens for variable uh, renewables. So just uh, to remind you, um, by construction in our data set, the OCGTs and the CCGTs do cover their costs. And so here we're going to see uh, for uh, variable rates what the economics is. So uh, we're looking at Europe globally, and we're looking at initially what shares of the marginal cost, uh, the um, renewables uh, are able to capture. So this is the graph on the left. So this is called the market value factor. And so we see that for wind, the market value factor goes from about 100% to, uh, to um, roughly 80%. Whereas when we look at solar, uh, we go from somewhere around 90% to less than 40%. So we see that um, the average market value factor drops a lot for solar more than it does for wind. And then if we remember the slide from a couple of slides ago, where we saw the um, marginal cost and we saw the marginal cost was dropping. So if we look at the actual average value, we see that for wind, the average value is divided by two and a half, whereas for solar, it's divided by five. And this comes from the fact, as we saw in one of the graphs earlier, that solar uh, production is concentrated on only a few hours during the day, and it's making the, um, it's making the, the value drop as the share of uh, renewable is increasing. So now the, the next slide uh, shows um, the market revenues compared to the cost for, for the different variable renewable energies. So uh, we have in a solid line, the market revenues that we uh, looked at for the European wide system um, by each technology. And in dash line, we have the costs that were taken by, that were taken from the, the WeHo uh, 2040. And so what we see is that on the left side of the graph, uh, the um, solid lines are above the dash line. So the um, renewable energies cover their, the market revenues cover their, their, the cost, whereas on the right side, the market revenues do not cover the cost anymore. And then, uh, so, and this is, All right, and so, um, so this is uh, to uh, summarize. We see that the renewables have a profound effect on the operation of the power system. So developing variable res has a small impact on the need for conventional capacity in terms of generation adequacy. The need for picking plants increases. The cost structure is changing. So we see that the share of fixed costs increases sharply. The market value factor decreases for variable res as share increases. And uh, we see that the market revenues do not cover costs with a CO2 price of uh, 90 euros per ton for variable rest shares higher than 33%. And so this asks the question at what market design is um, adapted for power system with large shares of uh, VRES. And this is something that will be looked at in different uh, work packages in this uh, in user UC effects project. And I will now give the floor to UC Yakehemo from VTT. Thank you, Caroline. 
Um, you can take the next slide. Uh, so for the Nordic system, we analyzed uh, three different scenarios. The energy transition and uh, renewable ambition, which, uh, which are common for the SysFlex project. And uh, the high solar scenario is a sen sensitivity scenario uh, just for the Nordic region. Uh, you can see that um, uh, these uh, shares of uh, variable renewable energy generation are quite a bit uh, lower than in uh, the continental system, for example. <clears throat> and this is because uh, uh, the energy transition and the renewable ambition scenarios are based on the EU reference scenario. And uh, unfortunately, this is the situation in, in those uh, scenarios based on the, on the input data. And uh, the high solar scenario is based on our previous results. And um, uh, also in that case, it seems that um, uh, it's not uh, economically viable to set uh, very high solar power capacities in the Nordic countries. Uh, this is partly because uh, there is already a lot of hydropower and uh, nuclear power in uh, Nordic countries. So there is not, not so much room for uh, solar power. Uh, from the picture, you can also see that uh, there are interconnections between uh, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, and the continental system were included in the simulation. And uh, the exchange time series for these interconnections we took from the results of the continental model. So we can speak about uh, a kind of soft link between these two models. Okay, next slide. Yeah, you can take the next slide. Uh, so here you can see the model framework. Uh, we used uh, uh, the interconnection flows from the continental model uh, to our unit commitment model, which you can see on the uh, lower left corner. And uh, uh, then because the optimization horizon of this model is not very long, uh, then periodically, we also run a, a model which is specifically used for uh, assessing the value of uh, large uh, hydro reservoirs in the system. And uh, this is shown on the, on the right. Uh, so uh, from the unit commitment model, we take the current hydro situation and uh, then as a result, we get uh, the value of the reservoirs. Uh, and for this uh, uh, long-term model for the hydro reservoirs, uh, we used uh, several years of uh, historical hydro inflow and uh, wind power generation data series. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, then we go to results. Uh, here you can see the effect uh, of uh, solar, solar PV on the uh, marginal costs of the system. So in every country, we can see that uh, there's a, a decreasing effect from the solar PV, but uh, not, not so many, not so large dif differences between individual countries. Um, we, we should also remember that um, uh, this uh, effect is not only because of the uh, increased uh, solar capacity in Nordic countries, but uh, also because of the interconnections um, um, uh, to the Nordic uh, continental system. Okay, next slide. Uh, Caroline already introduced the concept of a market value factor, and uh, here it is shown for solar PV in the Nordic countries. Uh, in the energy transition uh, scenario, 
the market value factor is quite high. Uh, this is because uh, the generation takes place during the day when the market prices are uh, usually higher than uh, average. And uh, with yellow color, you can see the high solar scenario results. And uh, the effect uh, is quite clear that uh, the market value factor uh, decreases. And the effect is high at the highest in uh, Denmark because uh, uh, it's uh, a small system and also there is no balancing effect from uh, hydro such as uh, in, uh, in the other Nordic countries. Okay. Um, for wind power, uh, analyzing the market value factor changes is not so easy from these uh, scenarios because uh, although in the renewable ambition scenario, the share of wind power rises about uh, uh, two and a half percentage points, there are also other ch changes in this scenario. Uh, so the comparison is not so easy. Um, but uh, still we can see that uh, uh, also for wind uh, the market value factor is the lowest in, uh, in Denmark because it's a small system and uh, not so much balancing, balancing from hydropower. Uh, then we go to, to the financial results. Uh, uh, so, can uh, these different uh, produ production forms cover their costs or not? Uh, here you can see the results for solar power, uh, utility scale, and uh, <clears throat> let me first explain a little bit, a little bit about this uh, picture. Uh, we first um, uh, uh, prepared uh, three different cost levels for all of these uh, different uh, generator, uh, generator, uh, generator types. And uh, uh, this ball in the figure shows the, the base cost level results. And uh, then the error bars, bars show the high and low cost levels. So we can see that <clears throat> the Utility scale solar power is uh, approaching uh, market parity. Uh, there are not very many differences uh, between countries. Um, this figure shows the, the average result for the Nordic re region. Uh, for the high solar scenario, as ex expected from the previous results, you can see that uh, the profitability is a bit lower than in energy transition. Okay, next. Uh, and wind power is uh, clearly profitable in all scenarios in the base cost level. Uh, for the high uh, cost level, there are some uh, financial gaps in, in um, quite many countries. Uh, with the ex exception of uh, uh, Norway, because uh, the wind conditions in Norway are quite good. And then uh, on the next slide, you can see the results for gas condensing power. And uh, we can see very great financial gaps for this uh, production form. And uh, then we can go to conclusions. Uh, the differences between the scenarios are quite small. Uh, uh, solar PV capacity in the Nordic region, we can see that it pushes the market prices down. Uh, and for the financial results, uh, uh, solar PV is approaching market parity and uh, wind power is clearly profitable on the average. But uh, in some countries there are financial gaps visible. And next, uh, uh, Carol will talk about the results of the Irish system. 
Okay, thanks, Yusi. Um, there are three key parts to my presentation. Firstly, I will present our key findings in relation to the changes in operation of the generation portfolio and production costs as we incorporate increased levels of variable renewables on the power system. I will then move on to the financial impacts this has for energy markets, including the effects on market prices and revenues, as well as financial gaps that may arise as higher levels of variable renewables are employed. In the final part of my presentation, I will outline two methodologies used to carry out an evaluation of system services, as well as the results of using these methodologies for the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system. Before I get onto the key components, I will briefly outline some background information on the models and assumptions used to complete our analysis. Firstly, I will introduce the scenarios used by Ergrid and Sony for the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system. These scenarios, also referred to as network sensitivities, were leveraged from work completed as part of tomorrow's energy scenarios. Each of these network sensitivities has its own specific storyline based on economic growth, energy policy, and technical as well as consumer behavior developments. Steady evolution sees only a small increase in deployment of variable renewable technology with seven gigawatts of installed winds and an annual demand for 2030 of 48 terawatt hours. Consumer action assumes eight gigawatts of installed wind with a demand of 58 terawatt hours. Low carbon living is the most ambitious of the scenarios with 10 gigawatts of variable renewable technologies. Special focus is placed on the low carbon living scenario, as this is very much in line with the government's climate action plan, which outlines that 70% of electricity requirements should come from renew renewable sources by 2030. It is important to note that similar trends for production costs and financial gaps were observed across all of the network scenarios. So I will now move on to um, air grid sensitivities and cases. So production cost analysis, as mentioned by Sheila, uh, was carried out using Plexus, which is a widely utilized tool for unit commitments and economic dispatch. The algorithm in Plexus determines the least cost manner in which to schedule generation to, to meet demand for each hour of the simulations whilst being subject to a number of operating constraints. So there were three key operating assumptions that we used for our analysis. For market only runs, there were no no constraints included whatsoever. For the next operating assumption, known as business as usual operation, several constraints were included. At present, there is constraint known as SNSP, whereby system non-synchronous penetration cannot exceed 65% of total demand. This limit is expected to be increased to 75% very soon. A rock-off limit of one hertz per second is also assumed in this operation, operation assumption. In addition, for system stability reasons, current operational policy requires that a minimum number of large conventional generating units are online at all times for system stability reasons. There are also operating reserve requirements included in the model for this operating assumption. For the final assumption, enhanced operational capability, it is assumed that technical scarcities can be mitigated through provision of system services and that these services are provided by a range of different, different technologies in the portfolio. portfolio sorry. Only one hertz rock-off constraint remains. And it is the provision of such services that facilitates lifting some of the business as usual constraints. In addition, for each of the network sensitivities, models were run using these operational assumptions with different wind levels. Other sensitivities such as high carbon prices and varying the level of solar generation were also carried out. Um, okay, so um, I'll just briefly outline the cost assumptions. So the fixed and capital costs for renewable sources were based on data provided by the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment. World economic outlook figures were also considered and found to closely align with the department figures. For existing conventional units, anonymized financial reports are published by the electricity regulators in Ireland and Northern Ireland, and these figures were used for conventional units. Analysis was carried out using a range of WAC and discount rates. And I will now move on to the um, production cost analysis section. So, so the first observation is that by simply adding increased wind on the system, that uh, reductions in 
CO2 emissions can be seen. Uh, the dark green line is the um, business as usual operating scenario. And by adopting enhanced operational capability, we see uh, reduced CO2 emissions to a value of 13% for um, an installed uh, wind of 10 gigawatts. Okay, so I'll move on to the next slide. Um, for system non-synchronous penetration, here we illustrate the additional one hours for renewable generation when high SNSP levels can be accommodated due to enhanced operational capability of the power system. This is brought about through provision of system services, which facilitates the lifting of the SNSP limits. However, if we retain the business as usual operating policies, dispatch down of renewables during those hours is necessary, as a number of large conventional units will need to be committed to keep the SNSP level below the 75% limit. Um, here uh, I look at the impact of renewables on net load. From the graph on the left hand side is it evident that in considering demand net of wind there's a huge increase in variability creating a need for flexibility. If we continue with business as usual operating policies this has little impact on the running patterns for CCGTs. However due to the increasing demand for flexibility we see a big increase in the run hours required from peaking plants. However, if through provision of system services from a range of technologies, enhanced operational capability of the power system is facilitated and the need for peaking plants diminishes. Um, um, and it, on this slide, we illustrate the changes in curtailment between business as usual and enhanced operational capability. So the evidence from looking at the business as usual curtailment levels that they can reach reach very high levels, particularly at high levels of installed wind. Uh, here, the steady evolution case shown in red for business as usual, um, curtailment levels of almost 20% can be observed. However, if we look at this for the enhanced operational capability uh, analysis, uh, we can see that this falls to below 15%. Okay, so I'll now move on to the financial analysis. And here we show the difference between average marginal price curves arriving, arising from low carbon living market runs with wind levels of 7 gigawatts and 10 gigawatts. It can be observed that the shape remains the same, but with higher wind levels, the price curve is shifted downwards. Um, and here we show the, that energy prices are falling. It can be observed here for the low carbon living scenario that is installed wind levels increase from seven gigawatts to 10 gigawatts as energy prices fall. We also find that as wind levels increase, the occurrence of zero marginal prices also, also increases. And this aligns with the results we have seen for the European continental system. I will now move on and show falling revenues that subsequently lead to financial gaps. So I will start with offshore winds. Um, on the left, the, the falling energy market revenues for offshore wind are shown across all three scenarios as installed wind levels increase from seven gigawatts to 10 gigawatts. On the dotted line, we compare these revenues against costs. So the dashed black line were the costs provided by um, our departments and the, the dashed gray line represents a lower cost scenario. Um, so on the dotted lines, we compare revenues against costs, and it is evident, particularly at high wind levels, that revenues are insufficient to cover costs. And it's important to note, uh, which is represented by the grey line, that as of October 19, offshore wind costs have fallen significantly. The reasons for this include innovations in wind turbine technology, economies of scale in operations and maintenance, and improved capacity factors from higher hull heights and larger rotor diameters. On the right hand side, we show the corresponding financial gap for each of the three network sensitivities. There are significant financial gaps in all network sensitivities and these increase with increasing wind level. Steady evolution sees the biggest financial gap in terms of euro per kilowatt and this can be attributed to this network sensitivity having the lowest demand and subsequently the lowest energy prices. And I will now move on to onshore. So there are similar trends for onshore wind for Ireland and Northern Ireland power systems. Unlike offshore wind, however, 
which has a relatively high investment cost, onshore wind seem to experience revenues that do not exceed their costs only when the total level of wind installed is exceptionally high. This is clearly depicted on the right hand side, which shows that onshore wind experiences financial gaps for all of the sensitivity studied with the highest levels of installed wind generation. And it's important to point out it's not just renewables that experience financial gaps. In addition to variable renewable technologies not earning sufficient revenues, uh, it is evident that existing units, including gas units, are not earning enough revenue. For the low carbon living sensitivity shown here, as levels of installed wind increase from 7 gigawatts to 10 gigawatts, revenue for gas plant decreases by 50%. It is evident that financial gaps for gas generators are more prominent at higher penetrations of installed wind. This is true for all of the network sensitivities examined for Ireland and Northern Ireland. And on this slide, uh, we illustrate the financial gaps per annum for each technology for the low carbon living network sensitivity in 2030. Financial gaps are shown for the high, medium and low cost assumptions. The overall financial gaps across all technologies varies from 1 billion in the high cost scenario to 285 million in the low cost scenario. This clearly indicates that energy prices are insufficient to cover costs and that there is room for an additional revenue stream. So to recap, it is evident that there is a significant downward trajectory on market prices as variable renewable penetrations increase. Financial gaps arise for a range of different technologies even when a high carbon price has been assumed. There is clear evidence that there is room perhaps for an additional revenue stream. I will now move on to the final part of my presentation, um, which focuses on an evaluation of system services. So we now consider how to determine an overall value for system services. In its simplest terms, this could simply entail taking the change in production costs that arises for each network sensitivity when system operation can be changed from a business as usual operating assumption to one of enhanced operational capability. Uh, as, can, as we can see, the changes in production costs, they vary uh, from a in the range of four, between four and 10%. However, this is an under evaluation of system services as it does not consider the impact of increased wind levels that also arise due to provision of system services. To determine a more reflective value, um, we begin with the base case network sensitivity with a business as usual operating assumption and a wind level of seven gigawatts. Yeah, sorry, next slide. Yeah. Um, if we increase the wind level to 10 gigawatts, while also assuming system services from a range of technologies will allow enhanced operation capability of the power system, this value becomes far more significant. For the low carbon living scenario, this is in excess of 700 million. And we believe this value will increase further should we include externalities such as the benefits of reduced carbon emissions. Um, here we compared the results of system service evaluations for each network sensitivity with the corresponding range of financial gap associated with each scenario. The ranges for financial gaps are based on the high, medium and low cost assumptions. It is clear from the financial gaps observed that there is a need for an additional revenue stream. It is also apparent that there is a significant benefit in provision of system services in reducing production costs by facilitating increased variable renewables. It is evidence from these results that system services could be the much needed revenue stream whilst also mitigating the technical scarcities identified in task 2.4. And just to, um, just, just to go through the key messages, uh, to summarize the key findings, integration of increased variable renewables brings about big changes to system operations. The downward trajectory of energy prices creates financial challenges for a range of technologies, particularly as high um, renewable, variable renewable penetrations. And we consider that system services could be one of a range of mechanisms to support mitigation of the technical and financial challenges. So I will now hand back to Sheila.
Thanks, Carol. So from the presentations today, it is clear that the power system is being transformed by the large scale deployment of variable renewable energy, whether this is at the pan-European power system level, the Nordic power system level, or at the level of the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system. Although it has been illustrated that increasing penetrations of variable renewables may have little impact on the conventional generation fleet from an adequacy point of view, the operation of conventional generation is changing indicating a shift towards more flexible technologies. It is important to remember that a, a portfolio that meets generation adequacy criteria may not necessarily have the required flexibility and capability. The analysis of the effect of variable renewables on the net low profile illustrates the driver for the need for greater levels of flexibility, while the work in TAS 2.4 clearly showed the need for a wide range of capability from all power system resources. Without flexibility, and capability. It has been demonstrated that the number of hours for variable renewable energy generation exceeds demand increases sharply with increasing levels of renewables. This could be an issue for many countries, for example Germany, where curtailment and congestion levels are already significant today. Furthermore, it was found that reliance on conventional generation to provide the needed flexibility and capability could offset the decarbonisation benefits associated with high levels of renewables. Using the Ireland Northern Ireland power system as an example, incorporating enhanced system services could be a mechanism to incentivise greater levels of capability from all system resources and could support the reduction of curtailment and realisation of renewable decarbonisation benefits. In addition to these system operation impacts, it has also been shown today that an energy owned market will not provide sufficient revenue in a high variable renewables future to cover investment costs. There is evidence of financial gaps even for solar PV in the Nordic system, which although has high levels of renewables, has lower levels of non-synchronous variable renewables compared to the other two systems discussed. There are profound downward trends of market value factors and revenues for variable renewables in both the continental system and the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system. Even with high carbon prices, significant, significant financial gaps still remain. The financial implications of high levels of renewables raises the question of the appropriate market design to compensate energy, flexibility and capability providers adequately and to promote the investments needed by the European power system to provide quality service to customers. The study from the Ireland and Northern Ireland power system on the value of system services indicates that there is huge potential for system services to provide a viable revenue stream for generators and service providers. The benefit of system services is that they support the mitigation of both the financial issues discussed here and the technical challenges that were identified in TAS 2.4. Indeed, it is worth noting that the work completed by PSE in this task demonstrated that the provision of enhanced system services for mitigation of voltage stability issues on the Polish network was less expensive than investment in network assets. In terms of next steps, the final task in Work Package 2, TAS 2.6, will seek to demonstrate that the provision of system services from a range of different technologies can mitigate or at least support the mitigation of some of the significant technical scarcities that were identified in TAS 2.4. Caroline raised the question around the suitable market design for power systems with large shares of variable renewables. This question and others have been examined as part of Work Package 3 in EU SISREX. As I mentioned in my introduction, there will be two webinars taking place in June detailing this analysis, and I would like to encourage you all to register for those very interesting webinars. Thank you all for your attention today, and I'd now like to hand you over to Marianne Evans, who is the technical manager for the project to moderate the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Sheila. And again, I would like to thank, um, well, yourself for the coordination and all the speakers for this very interesting and comprehensive work. So now we will move to the Q&A session and uh, we have quite a few questions. So first there is, um, there are quite a few questions uh, to all the speakers um, regarding the assumptions uh, of the models. So if each of you in turn could give um, some details about the models uh, used uh, and the assumption for the electricity demand and um, as well for the costs. So I will um, first maybe uh, give the floor to Caroline 
and uh, then to UC and then to Carol. Um, hi. So um, we have so the, there are a lot of uh, sources uh, to describe the model because it's uh, like I, I was saying it's a very uh, comprehensive uh, model and data set. I think the um, so we are all based on um, public uh, data and public uh, scenarios. Uh, the uh, detail uh, can be found on the uh, deliverable uh, 2.2 uh, that was mentioned uh, by Sheila. And uh, so globally, we based ourselves on, on the uh, European reference scenarios. And so um, we have, um, uh, so the, just to give like a couple, uh, couple uh, ideas uh, for the European power system, uh, the, at 2030, like the um, energy transition, we're going to have uh, more uh, coal inside the, the power system mix. And then uh, the power system is going to be changing towards a power system that is uh, going to have more renewable. Uh, the coal is going to be transferred to, uh, to more CCS. And so this is why uh, we took this as a basis for our uh, sensitivities. And as far as the cluster concern, um, uh, we we can uh, I think the the report will have uh, all the different data for each of the different technologies. So I'm going to hand over now to to uh, Sheila and Ergrid. So the the assumptions that we used to build our scenarios were from the tomorrow's energy scenarios, um, which were developed in 2017 for the Ireland power system. So that was a very comprehensive um, piece of work, which involved various stakeholders from, from the industry. Um, and from that, uh, the scenarios were developed and there were, there were various different sensitivities around the demand levels um, and the types of new technologies that would be considered in 2030. Um, in terms of the, the Northern Ireland scenarios that we used um, in, in this project, there were no tomorrow's energy scenarios developed at that stage, there are now. Um, so what we had to do is we relied on the, the TYNDP scenarios from 2018 and we combined um, the assumptions around the economic development um, that, was, that was underlying the tomorrow's energy scenarios and compared that with uh, the assumptions for economic development in the, tomorrow's, in the TYNDP and we did a mapping of, of those scenarios and that was how we, we came up with the scenarios for Northern Ireland. So the, the detail, as Caroline mentioned, of the scenarios and um, the specific um, capacities for each of the different technologies is available in the, the TASC 2.2 report, which is available on the website. Yussi, are you um, able to speak next about the, the VTT model? Uh, yes. Um, so the capacities we take mostly from the EU reference scenarios which are the basis for the SysFlex core scenarios. And uh, then uh, costs uh, are all from uh, public sources. So we have these three different cost levels and uh, the exact references you can find uh, from the report uh, uh, 2.5. Um, yes, and uh, we try to do uh, synchronize most of our inputs uh, with the continental model because uh, we perform this uh, soft linking through the interconnections so so it's quite uh, beneficial to uh, use the same input data as far as possible um, but of course there, there are some differences between our models and maybe a complimentary uh, question for you, you see, um, what exactly is the high solar scenario in the Nordic? Because maybe it wasn't so um, much detailed in the presentation. And what would be the interest uh, in the Nordic countries where there are much less sun in the long winter uh, to have a high solar scenario? Yes. So the high solar scenario has about uh, three percentage points of demand, more solar PV production. And uh, this is because uh, 
the EU reference scenario is quite uh, backward in terms of uh, solar PV in Nordic countries. So, uh, so the capacities in those scenarios are very low. So for that reason, we needed an additional sensitivity scenario and uh, the solar capacities in, in that scenario is based on uh, our previous resu results from other approaches. Thank you. There's also an additional question uh, to Carol. Um, if you can confirm so uh, about the low carbon living scenario, that the methodology for the calculation of the benefits is the same uh, or the same basis, the same type of calculation uh, that the one for that was done for DS3 uh, for 2020. This is a question to either Carol or Sheila. Yeah, I, I can take that question. So it is it is the same methodology. Um, so Carol showed that there's um, that we did a comparison of of purely looking at at the production costs alone, where we, we keep the the installed wind capacity fixed. Um, but that was that was only part of the method. The additional the additional method then included consideration that uh, using enhanced system services can allow for greater investment in in wind capacity. So yes, it, it is the same methodology that was used for twenty twenty. Okay. Sorry, I'm back now. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the correct answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, well, still on the construction of the models and scenarios. So, um, why do we not see energy storage systems uh, or uh, an action of demand response in those scenarios? So, maybe a generic answer from Sheila, because. Uh, it, uh, it concerns the next steps of work package two, and then um, maybe each of you can give uh, some more details about uh, the different parameters that you're studying. Thank you. So Sheila? Yeah, so uh, there were some assumptions around uh, demand response um, in the various different models. I know for the, the AirGrid and Sony model, we did have um, assumptions around particular levels of demand response. And uh, we also had, um, pump storage included and we had battery storage included. Um, as part of task 2.6, we will be looking at um, mitigations for the technical scarcities that were identified in task 2.4. So we will be looking at um, what batteries can provide and how batteries can, can support the system by providing various different system services. We'll also be looking at uh, using demand, respo demand response to not only provide system services such as uh, reserve services, but also being in a position to provide energy arbitrage um, and potentially helping um, uh, alleviate some congestion and containment issues. So maybe, um, would you like Caroline to add something on the continental system or? Um... Sure, yes. Uh, so, um, on the continental system, uh, we have um, uh, pumped hydro storage and we also have some uh, demand response form as a uh, part of the load profile. Uh, for example, we have electric vehicles and we have water heaters to just cite a few. And so this gives us, uh, so it's pre-optimizing the lo load profile. So this gives us a first step of uh, demand response. And uh, as part of uh, task 2.6, we we're going to be uh, investigating uh, further solutions. Thank you. You see, would you like to add something for the Nordic system? Uh, yes, for the Nordic system, we also included uh, electric, electric vehicles, which uh, uh, is able to store electricity for short periods of time. And uh, also, of course, there is the uh, hydro system in Nordic countries, which uh, can store electricity. And uh, I believe uh, this also, uh, in most cases, uh, prevents the uh, use of uh, dedicated uh, electricity storages, because it would not, would not be profitable. 
And um, uh, third, uh, we also modeled uh, the district heating sector in Nordic countries. And uh, that allows us to use uh, heat storages as implicit storage devices. Thank you. Um, uh, Caroline, you've um, introduced um, an increase in the carbon price per ton um, that we saw on your presentation was not sufficient to cover the costs for the VRES share. But um, there is a question saying, have we studied or what carbon price per ton could cover and have we studied that the cost for the VRES share uh, over 50%? All right, that's a really interesting question. So uh, we had the uh, carbon price uh, from the uh, from the European uh, scenarios, and so um, we so which were which was uh, at the highest at uh, 90 euro per ton, and uh, we have not looked at uh, higher carbon prices. But this is something that is actually very interesting, and and uh, after a certain price, uh, we're going to be seeing an economics that would be more favorable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe, um, Sheila, you mentioned it. Uh, um, it would be interesting to have um, a few more words about uh, the congestion costs that have been studied by um, ENOG and PSC uh, that were not presented today, so, so that people know um, what's in the full report that they can find on the websites. So maybe, um, Sheila, if you want to um, give some more details about this work. Sure, no problem. So um, Energy um, have an awful lot of information and expertise in the area of, of congestion, man congestion management. And um, what is detailed in the report is around um, the costs that are associated with curtailment in Germany as a result of high levels of congestion on their network. And uh, what they were seeing is that at present, uh, congestion is causing costs of up to 600 million euro per annum. Um, and if there's no mitigations put in place and if renewable levels continue to climb, these congestion costs are expected to, to increase dramatically. And um, so there's a lot of detail in the report around those numbers and, and how they're projected to climb um, in the coming years. Thank you. So thank you very much about this clarification. And as uh, Sheila was saying, you can find, uh, of course, all the details in the report. Uh, this is, uh, there are quite a few uh, questions related to um, the system services and system services markets. And so I think it will be more a question to you, Carol. And uh, yeah. what system services have you looked into? Have you looked at uh, the different um, coming uh, platforms uh, from NSOE um, and how do you expect uh, this could provide sufficient uh, value um, to integrate uh, renewables in the system? Um, well, for task 2.5, we didn't look at the specifics of any individual services. We just assumed that um, by moving from business as usual Business, business as usual to enhanced operational capability that all of the system, all of the technical scarcities identified in task 2.4 could be mitigated. Um, and of course, in the enhanced operational capability, the only um, remaining constraint was the one hertz rock off, which we think will be there, still be there in 2030. So um, we didn't get into a detailed study of, of individual system services, just that they would mitigate um, a lot of the scarcity is identified in 2.4, but I think this is something that will be studied um, in further detail in, in Work Package 3. Um, but um, So hopefully that answers the question. So yeah, I, I confirm that part of this is studied in the Work Package 3 of the project, which is dedicated to the enhancement of the market design. Um, and just to remind, because Sheila mentioned it in the conclusion, that there will be uh, two webinars dedicated to Work Package 3 in June. 
Um, an additional question about uh, the scenarios and um, the future work. Will we address uh, hydrogen production in our scenarios? So I guess this is a, a question to all our uh, speakers. So maybe Caroline, would you like to go first? Uh, this is this is a very good question, and we are uh, right now uh, doing like the next studies that we will be doing for uh, TIES 2.6, and so we'll definitely look at the uh, at this possibility. You see, uh, hydrogen production is not included in these scenarios, but uh, uh, VTT is otherwise very active in this question. And Carol or Sheila for our grid. So there, there are no considerations for hydrogen production in our 2030 um, scenarios. Um, as part of TAS 2.6, we will be looking at the capability that can come from various technologies. So we're not going to be focusing on one particular technology over another. We'll be looking at the capabilities that can be can be brought to the system. Um, so hydrogen production um, could certainly be one of those technologies um, and we will definitely be looking at, at various battery storage um, in different parts of the network in TAS 2.6. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe another um, question that is um, uh, related to how to um, uh, fill the gaps. Uh, these fin financial gaps that uh, we have identified in the various studies. Um, so we can see that we're uh, moving um, to a system with higher uh, capital costs, capex. So um, this is based on the assumption that the uh, marginal costs for renewables are zero. Uh, are we also considering um, a CAPEX-based bidding scheme and that would help uh, fill the gaps uh, in the future? So even though it is maybe a question that will be addressed more in Work Package 3, but um, what have you uh, taken into account or what are you looking at in your various pe perimeters? So I don't know, uh, Caroline, would you like to go first? Uh, yes. So uh, right now we are indeed taking a, a marginal cost or, or a variable cost that is uh, zero for renewables. And uh, in the task 2.6, we will be uh, also taking um, the same uh, hypothesis. Uh, we are waiting also on uh, work package three to see uh, what some of their um, findings might be. Thank you. You see maybe and then Carol? Um, yes, the, this question was not uh, really considered um, for the Nordic system uh, in this uh, work package. Um, but uh, of course, uh, as we see uh, so from the results, uh, uh, there are some uh, quite high financial gaps uh, for gas powered uh, generator plants. And uh, there are already some mechanisms, for example, in Finland and Sweden for supporting these uh, plants, uh, which are necessary but uh, run uh, quite infrequently. Um, so I believe some kind of capacity market would be possible in this case. Carol? Okay. Um, so yeah, no, definitely we need to ensure we have the right investment environment with the right level of certainty for generators and, generators and service providers. And I think definitely energy markets um, are not sufficient to incentivize investment. So uh, yeah, we, we, we think definitely that um, there needs to be a correct framework for system services and that could potentially uh, be the missing revenue stream and uh, improve the financial um, capability of um, for all, across all technologies and um, also ensure a, um, a, a reliable power system with, with increased variable renewables. Thank you very much. Um, maybe 
this last question, um, which I find interesting, even though it's a bit complicated to answer, but uh, can we consider uh, that as we are finding financial gaps, electricity prices could go up and fill, help fill these gaps? So I don't know, it's a bit tricky, but uh, I don't know, maybe Sheila, you want to answer this question, take this question? Um, well, if we if we look at uh, what's been happening um, in recent years, we've seen that electricity prices um, have fallen because we're increasing renewables, um, and that that is that is likely to continue. Um, however, if we are if we are going to um, see and experience significant financial gaps, then perhaps there is a need um, for additional revenue streams. Um, but if we are adding additional revenue streams, we should ensure that costs do not increase. For consumers over and above um, levels that we're seeing, we're seeing currently, um, so customers should be experiencing the same levels of um, of service and, and same quality of service, but they shouldn't necessarily be experiencing increased costs. Um, so it's it's a very it's a very difficult balance between um, ensuring that we have the the right portfolio and the right mix of system services whilst also um, providing uh, a least cost service to customers. Um, but it, 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 is, uh, it is something that we're, we're looking at very closely in AirGrid and Sony. Um, and it's also something that, that's being looked at in, in Sysflex um, more generally. Yeah, and I guess we could um, discuss some more uh, when we address the market design enhancement with Web Package 3. So I think we've taken um, all the questions that were in the Q&R. And of course, if you think of more questions after this webinar, you can address them by mail, by email uh, to us. You can use, uh, so you see on this last slide, our contacts, uh, not only the website, but the Twitter, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn contact to use Sysfex. So feel free to address um, any more question that you want. So um, I want to remind as well that you can find the full reports, uh, not only the report that has been presented today, uh, thanks to our speakers, and that was really interesting, but you can find as well um, the report that we referred to that describe the scenarios, that describe also the models, uh, the one from the previous webinar on the technical um, shortfalls of the system with high uh, variable res penetration. So you can find all these reports uh, on the website of the H2020 project EUSYSFLEX, so um, EUSYSFLEX.com. Uh, so I remind that the next webinars will will be soon advertising for two more webinars dedicated um, on market design. So I hope you will be uh, able and interested to join uh, to join us again in those webinars. And so I want to close now this webinar by thanking everyone. So Sheila for the coordination, of course, all the speakers for the very interesting work and presentations. And uh, also thank you, Reactive, who have organized uh, all the logistics for this webinar. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you in June for the next webinars. Thank you. <laughs>